Bwana asifiwe. Two scriptures and then we invite the senior pastor. Sawa. Acts 6:4. If media you can give us Acts 6:4. And once again feel very welcome to come to the prayer meeting. That the scriptures say give your attention to prayer and yeah, so you can be busy with other things, making ugari and the skuma, but give attention to prayer and the word. And every day, remember how we used to sing in Sunday school? Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, if you want to. Emabia Mwenzako is not only for babies. <laughs> It's also for us. Second scripture, Hebrew chapter 1, verse 14. Hebrew 1, 14. I just wanted to point something there and then pray. Hebrew 1, 14, let's read together. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels are stronger than us. They move faster. They don't stop at petrol stations. They are filled from heaven. And they can deal with dark situations on your behalf. So how can you concentrate on the word and prayer? Is because the other things you need to do assign the angels. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve? If you come on school fees, I'll be an angel or Where you concentrate on prayer and the word. If you be an angel, you So tell your neighbor. All angels are ministering spirits sent to serve. Let's pray. Mighty Father, we thank you that we can gather tonight to hear your word and to be in your presence. In the presence of the Lord is a fullness of goodness, fullness of joy, fullness of God. And you are indeed a tower to which the righteous can run and be saved. Tonight we discharge your angels to take charge over other issues so that we can focus on the word and on, the pr on prayer. Have your way in our midst because we pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Please now put your hands together as we welcome the senior pastor, Ambrose. Nelson. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor you're looking good. Better than yesterday. And tomorrow. Even if I don't see you. You will shine. In Jesus' name. Meta, meta. Shiny, shiny. Sparkle, sparkle. One of these Wednesdays, all of you should come with shades. So that to keep your time to buy. This is the day the Lord has. What shall we do? Amen. We're talking about authorizing faith. We'd like to welcome those watching us online and wherever you are. It's good to be part of this Wednesday service. I want to read, I know Pastor Shira read from Hebrews chapter 1. I also want to read there so that I can use that to share the thoughts that we have tonight. But tell your neighbor, I can see you have faith. And it is ever increasing. I, I, I hope that your faith in this month of June is greater than your faith in January. May grow, eh? Amen. Now look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Let me start with verse 1. In verse 1, um, again, while we are standing there, uh, for those who came last Wednesday uh, during uh, men's week, we really want to appreciate your presence 
in that service. Um, ladies, um, even though there were very many men in the service, some of you came anyway. Hallelujah. And we are glad you did. Uh, because God speaks to all of us in amazing ways. It says this, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through what? Through the prophets. He did that when? He did that when? He did that when? In the past. <laughs> okay? And it says, he did that in the past through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Look at verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by who? By his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by what? His powerful word. That's why the word of God is very important. The Bible says, after he had provided purification for sins, he did what? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Verse 4. So, because of that, he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Do you, have you ever thought of any angels he did that? For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels do what? Worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, your throne, O God. Now, who is speaking? God is speaking, but he says, he calls the son what? Hmm? God. So God the Father is calling his son God, and he's saying, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, now, he's calling Jesus what? Lord. He says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a, a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So, by the way, let me ask you, who are these people who will inherit salvation? It's you. And so angels are there to do what? Huh? To serve. Now, the, the, other, the thing to ask is, are they serving you? Is that your current experience? Uh, or are they so idle? Now, I've said all that to tell you this. Jesus received 
superior authority. Tell your neighbor superior authority. Now, in Matthew 28, now he says it another way, Matthew 28, verse 18, the Bible says this, Jesus has just risen from the dead, and then he says, then Jesus came to them and said, some authority in heaven, all authority, we call that absolute authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So who gave it to him? God who? God the Father. He says all authority, just go back to verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he goes on to say, then uh, verse 19, because of that, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, I have absolute authority, but I'm giving you delegated authority and going to all the world. And now guess what? Verse 20 says, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely as you go, guess what? I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, who really is with us? Really. Who is with us on earth? The Holy Spirit. And because of the Holy Spirit, there is something God deposited in our lives. It is called faith. So tell your neighbor, I have faith. That faith takes on various phases. And in the month of June, we are saying this faith is authorizing. Tell your neighbor, authorizing. Authorizing basically means to give permission to do something, to give approval, to give permission, to allow, to consent. And I want you to know that you have no idea how powerful you are. So tell your neighbor, you thought you were powerful. I am very powerful. Tell them. Now, I can see you're not telling them with the confidence. <laughs> you have authority. I'm saying you have authority. The disciples didn't know that. And they, they struggled to understand the amazing authority they had. And so, the book of Acts, chapter 1, as Jesus begins to prepare them for his living, he said this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Verse 9 says, after he said this, he was taken before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. That was the last command Jesus gave the disciples was, you shall receive what? Power. He, he, he lifts and he leaves. Verse 10 says, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Who do you think were the two men? Angels. 
By the way, do angels exist today? Yeah, they exist today. They just basically live in two realms. They, they live in the spirit realm and they can come into the physical and go back into the spirit realm. So for example, tonight we have a number of angels in this auditorium. Hello? Many angels in this auditorium. If they want to reveal themselves, they can reveal themselves. If they don't want to, they won't reveal themselves. But let me tell you this. They are ministering spirits waiting to serve you. Hello? So two men appeared. They said, verse 11, men of Galilee. It's like saying men of Parklands. Hello? Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so when you hear he's in Kangware, he's not there. Because he's coming the same way he did what? He went. You shall see him when he comes back. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there were quite a number of people just waiting in Jerusalem until when? Until the Spirit comes. That happened, of course, they were to finish a few um, uh, things they needed to sort out. But in chapter 2 now of the book of Acts, verse 1, the day of Pentecost, he says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them, 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 all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Fast forward this to chapter 3. Chapter 3 verse 1. Now remember, they have received authority, but they have not exercised it yet. Are we together? Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. And for the first time, he began to exercise authority. He said, he didn't say, God, please help this man to walk. What did he say? In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that is called exercising authority or using your faith to authorize something that you know that God already has decided to give to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is within the kingdom mandate. You have authority to make it happen because you're within your kingdom mandate. And so you're not saying, God, if it is your will, may this be done. Every time you pray that kind of prayer, you are not exercising, authorizing faith. Now, it is not bad to ask and say, God, if it is your will, because at that time, you may not fully know what the will of God is. How do you get to know the will of God? You get to know the will of God by studying this book. If you're in a company and you don't know if some things are authorized or not, you basically just read the policy manuals of the company. Hallelujah. Maybe you came from a company, whatever you're asking was not authorized, but you come into this other company 
and it has an operating manual, and you check the policies, and you find there are certain things that are authorized that for you, for example, you have been authorized at your level of performance, you're authorized to have a vehicle and to have a driver take you around. Thank you, Jesus. Now, when you check the policy manual and you find that for your level of doing things, you're authorized for that, two things can happen. You can still drive yourself around. True? Because that is your ability. But you can also exercise and get the driver who is authorized for you to actually do what? Take you around. Because it is in this manual. Let me tell you this. God already has given you a policy manual. It is the word of? So find out what has been given. And Peter, in his mind, suddenly understood. This man who, is, who cannot walk, I, the kingdom authorizes me to bring healing to him. And so he says, so now, now let me read that verse. The book of Acts chapter, chapter 3. He's, then he says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Because I know it has been authorized. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, do what? Walk. Look at the next verse. He went ahead, taking him by the right hand. He helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong because heaven backed him up. Let me tell you this, heaven will back you up. The moment you understand the kingdom manual policies and you begin to activate him, the, the kingdom will back you up. The Bible says in verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? He then gives them the reason why this man could walk. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this by faith in that authority. Authorizing faith. Tell your neighbor, authorizing faith. By faith in that name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. By the way, you think that the people were the ones who were astonished. I think Peter himself was also so astonished. I mean, boom, this guy could walk. Now, the only person who did that was who? Was Jesus. But now Jesus was in their midst because he had given them delegated authority and it was working in them the same way it used to work in him. According to the kingdom operating manual, hallelujah, the book of John, chapter 14, section 12, hallelujah, let me read that. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going where? To the Father. Tell your neighbor you have authorizing faith. And by the way, that was in chapter, that, that was in chapter 3. Of course, chapter 4, they get into trouble with the authorities because they have done something they should not be doing. 
they are put into jail, they are beaten around, but chapter verse 12, Peter stands up and says something again to reiterate what he's doing according to the kingdom manual he was given. He says this, salvation is found, by the way, let me read from verse 10, because Peter is really speaking out, let me go to 9, let's see if it starts with the sentence. Okay, it says this, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, by the way, healing that man was an act of what? Was an act of kindness. Hallelujah. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you, what? Healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in some people. Hallelujah. In no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved, except whose name? The Bible says when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, in fact, they had finished in standard eight, and it just says that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. May you be with Jesus. May you walk under that authority. Now, this is what I want to talk to you tonight that you have authorizing faith and activating it, sometimes you will struggle, some, but as you put it to action, God will back you up. Amen? God will back you up. Sometimes in our prayers, we pray very feeble prayers because we are wondering, will God do it? What if he doesn't do it? Let me tell you this, we all go through that. But one day we find that God is going to do it. Let me show you this verse. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says this, 1 John, it says this, this is the confidence we have. Tell your neighbor confidence. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to what? His will, he does what? He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Even though you may not see it physically. You have it. You know, faith is a receipt. Tell your neighbor, faith is a receipt. One time we went to, to buy sofa. A sofa set. Tell your neighbor, a sofa set. Hallelujah. <laughs> Went to buy a sofa set. Upper two Westlands. So we looked at the sofa and then we paid some money. Um, and then they gave us a receipt. And they told us they were going to deliver it in three days. So we went home with a receipt. When we reached home, did we have the sofa set in the house? Think about it. Did we have the sofa set in the house? Now, remember, we have paid for it. They have given us a receipt and they have given us the telephone number of the guy who will deliver it. Thank you, Jesus. They have told us when it will be delivered. We are in the house with a receipt to that effect. Do we have the sofa set in the house? <laughs> now, 
Let me read um, Hebrews chapter 11, Amplified Version, verse 1, just to help some of us. Amplified Version, let me read that for you. It says, now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality, Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. So let me ask that question again. <laughs> when we enter the house with that receipt, did we walk into that house with the sofa set? By faith. I was not talking by faith. I'm saying the receipt. The receipt was evidence of what? Of the sofa set. It was as good as what? Thank you, Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? When God guarantees you by his word that what you asked for he has given you and by his word faith believes in that word you have evidence of what he has asked for it is just a matter of time. The people who are supposed to deliver what you ask for are angels. So in that house we sat there we had the sofa set in the house. And if somebody came and says, do you have a sofa set? Do you have a new set? Ah, yes. Here it is. <laughs> Evidence of things hoped for, convinced of things we do not see. And for sure, in the next three days, it was delivered. And now we had that which was hoped for becoming a reality in the house. Let me tell you this. Some of your prayers that you keep repeating God already answered. And you have the evidence. The only thing is that you went home with a receipt and then threw it in the dustbin. Go look for it. Pull it out and say, this is my evidence. Now, in three days, if they did not deliver that sofa set, what do you think we should have done? We, should, we, should have, we could have walked into that shop and said, our sofa set... They looked at it. It has not been delivered. When what is happening? You see, that's how you can go back to God with the word and say, God, it was supposed to be delivered. It has not been delivered, but I have the receipt. I have the faith for it. <laughs> and God will make sure it has been delivered. And so that makes prayer much, much easier. It is not a hide and seek with God. It is not maybe, and it's not the things we say sometimes in Sunday school. When you ask God, God may say no. He may say yes, or he may say, that is Sunday school. That's not your, your level of faith. Your level of faith is this, that if you, whatever you ask, God has done what? Has given it to you. It's a matter of time. Sometimes the time is very brief. So sometimes you just have to wait briefly. Sometimes it may take a month, it may take three months, but let me tell you this, it is coming your way. When a woman conceives and she has the evidence of her, her conception. The baby is delivered in how many months? Yeah. You don't sit there and say, I have the evidence of being pregnant, but I don't think I'm pregnant. Maybe, maybe not. But watch out for me. The woman now begins to plan for that child right there. Let me tell you this. 
Let's treat God's word like that. This is our operating manual. This is the kingdom manual. It has all his policies. That's why the Bible says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Let me read Psalms chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. I believe somebody needs this word somewhere. It says, but those, but whose delight, let me go to verse 1 so that I can pick this up. Psalms 1.1, 1, 1. blessed is the one who does not walk. Tell your neighbor, blessed. Blessed is the one who does not walk in, in, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law once a week. You see, when you read this book day and night, pretty, you get very used to the policies and the documents and the sections and the chapters, and pretty soon you begin to know this is God's will, this is not God's will. This is for me, and this is for us as a people, this is mine as an individual, this is for us as a church, A, B, C, D. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on it, his law day and night, verse 3. That person is like what? It's like a tree planted by streams of water. So tell your neighbor, you're like a tree. Planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither some of the things he does. Whatever they do, prosper. Why? They understand the kingdom operating manual. Amen? Amen? So look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, do you have the kingdom operating manual? Now some of, you, some of you may not have it physically. Some of you have it on your phones. Hallelujah. Some of you have it on your tablets. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Some of you have it memorized. It is right inside here. Uh, whatever you do will do what? will prosper. So, how does having this authorizing faith turn out into your life? What does it do? This man who knows the will of God, this man who understands how this manual operates, what kind of confidence do you begin to have? How do you begin to operate in life? So, five things that I want to bring to your attention. Five things. For you to have this authorizing faith, these five things begin to happen to you. Number one, it gives us courage. Number two, it moves us as a strong tower. Three, it engages us as champions. Number four, it enables us to have endurance. And number five, it releases to us boldness to approach the throne of God, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But it gives us courage. Underline the word courage. Huh? The word, it gives us what? Courage. Just go back. Go back to those five things. The word courage, the word strong tower, the word champions, the word endurance, and the word boldness to approach. The word courage, strong tower, Champions, endurance, boldness to approach. I hope those words describe you. They must describe you. For faith to authorize things in the kingdom, those five things must become real in your life. Let me start with the first one. It gives us courage. And I want to say that I'm talking to people of courage. I'm saying I'm talking to people of courage. I want to talk about the Daniel factor. And I'm going to use these examples in the Old Testament to kind of just help us to understand authorizing faith. The Daniel factor, this man who had courage. Even when there was so much opposition, and we are talking about all kinds of oppos opposition. So much, but I'm telling you, you're more than conquerors. You may face opposition. I don't worry about opposition. But I always say, when it comes, God already has an answer for it. Don't fear opposition.
I thank God for automatic cars. Hallelujah. Some of you don't remember the days we used to have the, um, the shift gears. One of the things I used to fear a lot with shift gears those days is climbing a hill. Because you had to learn how to change the clutch, the brake, and the accelerator. You're going up the hill, you know? And you change the clutch and, 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 and those things, you know? Uh, sometimes with a clutch, it go, 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 and, and then you start hearing the smell of the clutch. How many of you ever went through that situation? Now, there are some people who were born the other day who have no idea what we are talking about. But don't worry about those days because these days you have what? Automatic. Let me tell you this. God has put the Holy Spirit inside you. You have automatic gear so that when you face opposition, all you have to keep stepping on is the accelerator. The, those gears will change themselves. Receive it. Amen? Don't worry about the position. God has inbuilt in you the ability to handle opposition. Daniel experienced courage because he understood what authority is. By the way, Daniel was a man of great authority. And you know what he did in Babylon. But let me read something about the opposition he faced um, at the workplace. Now let me ask you, many of you have just come from the workplace. Let me tell you this. Your most challenges will come from the workplace, not from church here. In church here, we are good. Hallelujah. We are good. Out there, try telling people in your, in your workplace out there tomorrow, you're looking good. Better than yesterday. You're talking to me. <laughs> they wonder what are you trying to say? Uh, they, they talk completely a different language. There's opposition that side that in church we deal with another language which we understand, we are comfortable with it, but in the marketplace is very different. Listen to what happened to Daniel, but he had courage to handle those things. Daniel chapter 6 verse 1, the Bible says this, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three chief ministers over them. One of them was who? Was Daniel. There were 120. Over the 120 are how many? Three. One of the three is who? Is Daniel. The Bible says the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Prophet, he needed prophet. Verse 3, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the chief ministers. By that he means that, that the three, he was top. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the chief ministers and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the, the whole kingdom. That word, go back. That word, to set him over the whole kingdom means what? Promotion. Tell your neighbor, promotion is your portion. Tell them one more time. Now, let me tell you this. The moment you are just about to be promoted at your workplace, that's when opposition shows up. Ile serious. Now, look at this, verse 4. Verse 4 goes on to say, At this, the chief ministers and the satraps try to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him. Can, can you read one day the headlines in the nation one of these days? That they could find no corruption in Kenya. Hallelujah. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of who? Of his God. So these chief ministers and satraps went as a group 
to the king and said, and let me tell you this, people will go behind your back. People will go behind your back, not in front of your front. They will go behind <laughs> your back. What I could you what they'll find ways. Let me tell you, in the marketplace, that is normal. Tell your neighbor it is normal. So these chief ministers and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal ministers, prefects, satraps, and advisors and governors have all agreed. Now, they, they had not agreed. They just, about three of them are the ones who had agreed. And they got everybody into that group. The royal ministers, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the, lion of the lion's den. Now, they were saying that knowing that only one guy will go against it. Who is that? Let me tell you this. The enemy knows your strength. Let me say it one more time. The enemy knows your strength. He knows where to attack you. He knows your weakness, but he knows your strength. Look at verse 8. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Verse 9. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Why do you think he put it in writing? They had really praised him. Hallelujah. Walimuinua, walimbeba. Thank you, Jesus. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published because he got the, it was CC'd to him. <laughs> Hello. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Ladies and gentlemen, that is courage. And I want you to know that authorizing faith will give you what? Will give you courage. Verse 11, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying, asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, keep going, uh, your majesty would be thrown into the lands then? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to, him, to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, now they're using his tribal status. He's a foreigner, but he's in our midst. Are you getting what I'm saying? They're using his tribal status. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sunset to save him. He went to the courts. He looked for some of his lawyers to see where they could change it. They could not change it. Let me tell you this. God is fighting for you. Amen. Be courageous. God is fighting for you. Verse 15, then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. They had cornered him. Keep going. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, can you imagine this guy who is a foreigner, believe that Daniel's God is God. May people know that your God is God. Be strong and courageous. The king said, may your God. He didn't say, may our gods. By the way, in Babylon, they had many of them. He said, may your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. Verse 17, he goes on to say this. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the, of the, of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring. 
and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Let, listen to me. Somebody has done something about you and whatever they have decided is not going to be changed. It has been signed, sealed, secure. And according to the laws of the land, it cannot be changed. But I'm telling you, be courageous. Something is about to happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Something is about to happen. There is a, a greater God. You can walk around with your receipt of faith and say, God, you said. Mm, you said. The Bible says in verse 18 of that chapter, and I like this part. It says, then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. That, that's a funny thing because he's in the palace, he's in the king's bed. Hallelujah. Daniel is in the dungeon between the two who is sleeping. I'm telling you, no matter where you're facing, just sleep. May peace be upon you tonight. Let, let, let the others be the ones worrying and turning in their beds because victory belongs to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 19, at the first light of dawn, at the first light of dawn, the king got up. The, by the way, Washira is the one who wakes up very early in the morning, around 4 o'clock. At, at the first light of dawn, by six, he has already done a few things. At, <laughs> at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. Listen to what he says. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel in a strong voice said, may the king live forever. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Even those guys who authorize that you be thrown into those dungeons, when God rescues you, please have manners. Continue to <laughs> acknowledge that they are still your boss. <laughs> Somebody better give God a big hand and tell God thank you. Uh, don't take on spiritual arrogance. Hmm, why are you calling me? <laughs> I told you my God is bigger than you. Shindwa katika jina laisu. So go back. Remember this verse. Let's go back to verse 11. Hmm? Daniel answered, May the king... It's like saying to your company director, may you be director forever. <laughs> may the king live forever. But look at verse 22. He gives a testimony. He says this, may God, my God sent his angel. That's why we are talking about ministering spirits. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. No, have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty, and you know it. The king was overjoyed. And he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Amen. He had trusted in his God. He came clean. Let me tell you this. You're coming clean out of that situation. You're coming clean out of that situation. No wound. You're not going for uh, psychological counseling. I'm telling you, you're coming out clean because you trusted in the Lord your God. Look at the next verse. At the king's command, this is, the king now is upset. After becoming very joyful, he's now upset for being led astray. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den. The bad thing about this is that now innocent people were now part of that situation. Along with their wives and who else? Their children. 
And the lions, this time, did not give them a chance. It says, and before they reached the flock of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Let me tell you this. Don't, this is a prayer I do not pray for my enemies. But let me tell you this. When God decides to fight for you, he will fight for you. Don't fight. The battle belongs to who? To God. You just have courage because authorizing faith gives you that courage. Look at that last verse. He goes on to say this in the next verse. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. Oh, that was a good letter. He says, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is, now he, the king now is giving his own testimony in writing. For he is the living God. And he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Hallelujah. I like this story. Daniel chapter 6. It simply tells me that my faith in God gives me courage despite the oppositions that come my way. Hallelujah. I walk with confidence. Huh? And so I'm saying for you who are in the marketplace and some people of, of authority around you have ganged against you and are about to choke your life out, let me tell you this. Be strong and courageous. Keep praying. Keep trusting. God knows how to fight your battle. He has done it before. He will do it again. Hallelujah. He will do it again. Leave it in his hands. He knows what to do. Don't become God's counselor. Hello? Don't become God's counselor. He knows what to do. But that is just the first one. I pray that I can finish the rest in the next few minutes. Number two. Authorizing faith moves us as a strong tower. David Factor. You see, there's a verse in the Bible that says, the name of the Lord is what? It's a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are? They're safe. Now, usually when we think of a tower, we think, for, for, for example, this flag is a tower. A tower is a fortress, like Fort Jesus. How many of you have ever gone to Mombasa to Fort Jesus? It's like a tower like this. So, we are saying, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Which means is that if I'm going to be safe, I have to go hide in that tower. That's the first meaning. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they're safe. So when everything is okay outside, I can come back and just know that everything is fine. And suddenly when trouble shows up, again I do what? I run. Now, can you imagine Christians being like that? We are always escaping from trouble. We're always running. Now, that is the first meaning. But the second meaning is this. Not only do we run into this tower, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The second thing is that when we are in this tower, and we are hidden in this tower, and this tower is covering us, now we are in the name. Now we don't have to keep running into this name. Now we deal with opposition in the name. So we move with the name. Hallelujah. So who is now fleeing from us? The enemy, because he cannot handle this tower, but this tower is going everywhere we go. Are you entering this? So we are not running into the tower hiding and coming out. No, you are entering the tower and staying in the tower and you walk with that tower wherever you go. And opposition begins to run away and it cannot get you. First of all, it cannot get into you, but you are so strong 
you're passing through every gate and every obstacle because this tower is strong and mighty. For David, let me read for you 1 Samuel chapter 30 because that's where we find that story. It says this quickly. David and his men reached Ziklag. Tell your neighbor Ziklag. On the third day, now the Amalekites, who are very crazy guys who used to beat up Israel all the time. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burnt it. And had taken captive the women and everyone else in it. Both young and old, they killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept silently. Now who usually weeps, men or women? But this time the men were doing what? They wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Any things were bad. Tell your neighbor things were bad. Look at the next verse. So, verse 5, very quickly. Verse 5. David's two wives had been captured. And that's a statement, by the way. That's just a statement. How many wives did he have? It's a statement. He's not telling where that is Christian or not. He's just telling you a statement. So when you read verses like that, don't start squirming in your, in your seat. It's just a statement. David, and of course God knew he had two wives, so that's why he put it in the Bible. Praise God. <laughs> David's two wives had been captured. One of them is called did you know David had a wife called Ahino, Ahinoam of Jezreel? And the other one is Abigail, the widow of Nabal. And if you, that story of Abigail is a very interesting story. We'll not talk about it today. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Now, opposition from outside and opposition from around you. The men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David... Found what? He said, David says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. He, 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 he got into this and, and, and he went and covered himself. But David found strength where? In the Lord his God. Now look at the next verse. The next verse says, then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the effort. Abiathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord inside this tower, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David and 600 men with him came to Bethel Valley where some stayed behind. So he started walking with what? With a tower. Are you listening to me? 200 of them were too exhausted. How many men were there? How many were exhausted? How many did he go with? I can see you passed maths. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley. But David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat. Part of a cake and of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived. This is your enemy, by the way. He needs information is required. For he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. Now, what did God tell them? Pursue you will overtake and you will recover. Now I'm telling you now in Jesus' name. You have a strong tower. Pursue. Hallelujah. You will recover. The enemy has stolen, but you're going to get it double. Hallelujah. Pursue. David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an, of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. When we raided the Negev of the Kerenites, Kerithites, some territory belonging to Judah, and the Negev of Caleb, and we burnt Ziklag. David asked him, 
Can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Malachites had taken. They needed to add that statement because... For David, that was a very important statement. He recovered everything, including... Let me tell you this. You know, God knows what things are precious to you. You will recover them. Hallelujah. I'm not asking you to have two wives. What I'm trying to say... Because some people read, people go home and say, hey... We received a revelation from church <laughs> that you can actually have two. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just reading for you these verses. Huh? But God knows what is precious to you. You will recover. But you have to be in the strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Some of you, what is precious to you are your children. Some of your children right now are not where they should be. And you're saying, oh God, when will, when, I, when will I recover them? The devil has taken them. They're in drugs. They're in depression. They're frustrated. They're not doing well in school. You know, um, the, instead of being A students, that because I believe them to be A students, right now they bring home E's. I'm saying you will recover. I'm saying you'll recover. They are your treasure. You love them. You will recover them. The Amalekites will not take them away. You are going to recover them. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Hmm? Some of you have lost precious money in certain deals. Hello? And you thought it was a good deal, but it turned out to be a bad deal, and you've lost money, which was not yours. You had borrowed it from somebody else. Hello? You are like that story in the book of First, First Kings, uh, not First Kings, Second Kings chapter 6, about this guy who was cutting wood with an axe. A laugh with the, the axe fell into the waters and it was borrowed. I want to declare to you, you shall recover. I'm assuring you, you shall recover. Look at the next verse. I was trying to go away from these two wives. Go to verse 19. Verse 19, nothing was missing. Young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. May that be your testimony. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Let me tell you this, the name of the Lord will not let you down. You can carry it with you wherever you go. You shall recover. That's the confidence you have. That is authorizing faith, where you tell God, will I recover? God says you will recover. Can I pursue? Yes, pursue. You have God's permission to make things happen in Jesus' name. It is in the operating manual, right here, written in God's word, you will recover. Hallelujah. And if you don't recover it in the shape it was earlier, you will recover it in a better shape. In Jesus' name. But let me see if I can tie this up with number three and then we will pray and handle the others later. Engage us as champions, the Gideon factor. Authorizing faith will make you a champion. I'm saying authorizing faith will make you a champion. In fact, you are a champion. You may not feel like one, but you are. I'm saying you may not feel like one, but you are. Walk out of this church saying, I am a champion in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
You're a champion. But let me give you a brief about Gideon, Judges chapter 6. The Bible says this. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. How many years? How many years? Seven years. Because the power of the Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. Can you imagine that devastation? You work for something and somebody comes and destroys it. Hello? You create a software, somebody else profits from it. Hello? You build a house, somebody else lives in it. Hello? They're the Midianites. That is the Midianite factor. They oppress you until you don't know how to be oppressed after that. It says they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. In other words, sometimes a situation comes and overwhelms you so much. There is no breathing space. Let me tell you this. God is about to give you breathing space. I'm saying God is about to give you breathing space. Some of you are gasping. You're gasping for life. God is about to set you free. The Bible says in verse 6, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, they cried out. So tell your neighbor, you better cry out. But not to me. Tell them, cry to the Lord. Tell them, I don't need to see your tears. Tell them, God needs to see your tears. For some of you men, you have never cried for the last 10 years. You cry, but like Pastor Washira says, the tears go into your stomach. They don't come out, they go inside. Go, go back to, I like this. This, this, is, this is liberating scripture. Go back, back to verse 7. Verse 7 says this. When, so there is a when in your life. Tell your neighbor there is a when coming. When the Israelites, they waited, they were screaming, they were shouting, but God could do nothing until they did what? They cried. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. That word simply means he sent them a word. I'm not talking about these prophets who pig a pig around. I'm talking about a word. Tell your neighbor, there's a word that is coming my way. Forget these people in, 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 in Kwavijiji, people who pray for others. Adi, I know somebody who can pray for you. Forget those prophets. We are looking for what? A word. He sent them a word. For some of you, the word is coming tonight. He's sending you a word. And that word will lift you out. He sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hands of, your, of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down. So he gives you a word, but he also brings you a messenger with a message. The angel of the Lord came and sat down at the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite. Tell your neighbor, God knows your location. I like that. God knows your location. God knows where you're staying. God knows your address. God knows all the Google Maps that can, can catch up with you. Amen? God knows you. The angel of the Lord came and sat down at the oak of Ophrah and that belonged to Joash the Abizarite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you. Champion. 
So I'm looking at champions. I'm looking at a champion. But in his condition was Gideon a champion? In his condition. Was he a champion? In his mind was he a champion? In God's sight was he a champion? Let me tell you this. God is looking at champions now. In Jesus name. And God will address you as a champion because he knows the potential you have. But listen to Gideon. This is how he starts talking. His brain has been messed up. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but, 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 but if the Lord is with us, yani you're saying the Lord is with us, but, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Uh, why was I sucked yesterday? Uh, why did my wife leave? Hello. And he left with everything we had bought. Hello. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? The things that Pastor Ambrose keeps telling us. Where are they? You know, you can start talking like that. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, you're a champion. Go in the strength you have. Let me tell you this. You have strength you don't know you have. I'm saying you have strength inside you. You have strength right now. In your weakness, you have strength. He said, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the... God did not have to argue with him. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Look at verse 15. Pardon me. My Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is what? The weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my family. I don't even have a savings account. The Lord answered, I will be with you. I am your savings account. I am your strength. I will be with you. I will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Who will strike them? God will. Gideon replied, now he's still dilly-dallying here. Now, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign. It's how we pray many times. Oh, Jehovah God, I've been timing this girl. But Lord, if it is your will, may she come for the prayer meeting in a green dress. Oh, Jehovah, she better come with a green dress. You arrive here, and about ten girls have? <laughs> you don't want to be like Pastor Ambrose one time. He had fallen in love with three girls. So he didn't know which one. Is it this one? Is it this one? Or is it that one? Lord, I like this one. Every time I see her, my heart stops. When I look at this one, my head stops. When I look at this one, my pocket stops. So Lord, which one? <laughs> so one time I wrote all their names on a piece of paper, three papers. And then I folded them, folded them, folded them. Then I put saliva on my, on my palm. Said, Father, I'm going to strike my saliva in the name of Jesus. And the direction the saliva goes, I know she's the one. So I said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tua! The saliva landed on one of the papers. I picked the paper. I opened it. It was Susan. I said, Lord, can we try again? So I just mixed them around. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's try again. Can you imagine those games? You know, one day when we, we go to heaven, we'll have a lot of fun because God will show us all the videos <laughs> of our lives. So you try again. Can you imagine hinging your marriage on saliva? And say, so how did you come? How did you people meet? And we met through saliva. Can you imagine? <laughs> So what happens when the saliva dries up? Quisha. Now people use this verse many times when they're looking for a sign. True? We're always asking God for signs. God, 
God wants you to go beyond signs. He wants you to use his word. Oh, Lord, may they, may they have green dresses. Then you have a lot of, seven of them have green dresses. Then you say, Jehovah God, the next prayer service, may they have green dresses and red shoes. Just tell your neighbor, don't look for signs. Tell your neighbor, don't follow signs. May signs follow you. Amen? Follow the word, follow the word. You'll end up in problems that I entered into by following saliva. I'm telling you, by the way, the funny thing is that those three ladies, I never married them. That story ended, they went their various ways. I married Martha without saliva. I'm telling you, God is a good God. <laughs> God is a good God. But let me finish this verse. Verse 17. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Verse 18. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. God sometimes can just play games with you. He'll wait for you. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket, and it's brought in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. Verse 20. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth and Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the stuff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread and the angel of the Lord. If you are in that situation, what would you have done? You would have scattered. Now listen to what Gideon says. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas! Sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the face of the Lord. I'm going to die. Look at the next verse. But the Lord said to him, Calm down. Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is peace. That's why we get the word Jehovah Shalom. May Jehovah be your shalom. Hallelujah. The Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah, the Bezerites. By the way, not to read the rest of this story, Gideon still came to God lo looking for more signs. But you see, he was helping this guy whose faith was totally finished. He was building, up, building it up step by step. God knows where you are. And sometimes your faith is so kidogo, but he understands he'll build it one day at a time. Your faith may not be like Pastor Ambrose's, but God will use what you have. And God will move you because God sees in you a champion. Amen? I'm looking at champions. I'm looking at champions. I would like the champions in the house to stand. Have you needed anything tonight? Yes. I don't know which part of this message you're going to share with your neighbors. How was the Wednesday prayer service? Hey! It was good. <laughs> <laughs> what did God say? Ah! He said you should not base your marriage on saliva. That's not what I said. <laughs> what I said is that you have authorizing faith that gives you courage. Amen? Number two, places you in a strong tower. And thirdly, it makes you a champion. It engages us as champions. I'll talk about the rest next week. But these ones, it gives us courage, moves us as a strong tower, 
engages us as champions. Courage, when Daniel faced opposition. Strong tower, when David faced opposition. Champions, when Gideon faced opposition. God already has an answer for any opposition that will come your way. Especially in the marketplace. In your families, at home, among the relatives. All kinds of things keep happening. But God already has an answer for you. You're more than a conqueror. You are a champion in Jesus' name. You may be asking God for signs and all kinds of things. But the Bible says, signs will follow you. Let me read that verse in um, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 17. The Bible says this. Mark 16, 17. Mark 16, 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. So the first thing you must do is what? Believe God. In my name, in my authority, through my authorization, as they activate their faith, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. You'll speak in a, in a different language. A language that blesses people in the marketplace. They will pick up snakes with their hands, a position that sometimes may want to poison you. They will drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on people who are ill and they will get well. Look at verse 19. After the Lord Jesus had spoken them, he asked, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Verse 20. The disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them. May the Lord work with you. The Lord worked with them, confirming his word by the signs that accompanied it. Confirmed, he did not confirm the signs. He confirmed the word. Forget the green dresses and the red shoes. He will confirm his word. Believe his word. His word will come through. It will prevail. Hmm? Acts chapter 19, verse 20 says this. Uh, Acts 19, 20. It says, In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Let me read that in the New King James Version, verse 20. It says this. This is the word. You can trust in this word. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and did what? Prevailed. God's word will prevail. Amen? You can walk around with that receipt and know that with this word you are guaranteed that that which you bought will be delivered to you. I'm saying the Lord is delivering your miracle. It's coming your way. It may take three days, it may take two days, but it is coming your way because you have the receipt of delivery. Hallelujah. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Let me read it in the Amplified Version. In the Amplified it says this. So the word of the Lord concerning eternal salvation through faith in Christ was growing greatly and prevailing. May God fight for you. May his word break the walls of opposition. You are already a champion. In Jesus name. You are full of courage like Daniel. Amen? You are a strong tower like David. You are a champion like Gideon. We'll talk of the rest next week, so come. But I want to pray for you and just thank God for his word. Why don't we give God a big hand and tell him thank you. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. I just stand and I hadn't seen that picture but there is Daniel and the lions do not know what to do with him let me tell you this your enemies will not know what to do with you you are a winner in Jesus name you are a winner in Jesus name you are a winner in Jesus name don't try to engineer your way out God is an engineer himself. 
He knows how to rescue his beloved ones. He will rescue you. Amen? Some of you are trying to try to get yourself out of this thing. Listen, God knows how to get you out. And he'll get you out clean. Hallelujah. He'll get you out clean. Because at the end of the day, who must you boast about? But God. Let your boast be in him. Are you in a financial quagmire? Let God rescue you out of it. He knows what to do. Are you in a relationship challenge? God knows how to untie you and pull you out. Are you in a political situation whereby you just feel your life is threatened? I want you to know there is a higher authority. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it. They are safe. You are safe. I'm saying you're safe. Consider yourself safe in the hands of the living God. But he doesn't just deliver you out like Daniel. He was delivered out, but then he was promoted. Delivered out into. So I'm saying you're going to be delivered out into. Delivered out into. <laughs> Hallelujah. Delivered out of a challenge into favor. Like Joseph, out of the dungeon one day, before the king, before he knew what he was doing, promoted, became prime minister, top of the land, like this. Let me tell you this. God has a 24-hour miracle waiting for you. Things can change in 24 hours. Things can change in 24 hours. And for God, the 24 hours can be even too long. He can turn a situation. Some of you, as you walk out of this sanctuary, your miracle will be already landing. The moment you step out, so you don't stay in here, you have to step out. Because if you stay here, the miracle will not come. The moment you walk out of that door, but don't rush, take your time. Because we might all find everybody stuck at the door. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion that can never be shaken. As the mountain surrounds Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Yes, come on, give God a big hand. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. One more time, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, Why don't you take a moment to just tell God thank you for the word tonight and then I'll pray for us. Just receive that word. If it is telling God, I receive your courage. Just tell him, God, as I walk out of this church, courage is my portion. The courage of Daniel is mine. I'm running into that strong tower. In the strong tower, I'm safe. You're walking out of this place saying, Lord, I'm a champion. Yes, I may be surrounded by enemies all around me. 
my situations are not becoming better they're becoming worse by the day but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world i'm coming out to walk into favor i'm coming out of a curse to walk into a blessing i'm coming out of nothing entering it into a place that has been prepared for me tell god and begin to thank him ahead of time thank him for the the solution that is already your portion there's a solution that is already your portion coming your way my god this is our moment this is our time we receive the miracles we receive the breakthroughs we receive the solutions we are courageous we are safe in the strong tower we are champions even when we don't feel like it we are champions we are more than conquerors father you have heard your people call on your name and i know you have not stopped listening to us because you continue listening to us even as we walk out of this sanctuary tonight Lord, I thank you for those watching us online that they too have received this word. That this word will prepare them to do exploits. The Bible says the people who know God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. I'm declaring to you, my brothers and sisters, you're going out to do exploits in the name of Jesus. You're, you may be thinking Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, Wakina David, Wakina Gideon were people from a very different caliber but guess what? We are just like them. And we still serve the same God they served. But now we have a greater revelation. How much more will God do in us if we put our trust in him? So Father, I bless your people. I know they are going out with solutions. I know they have carried their receipt of faith. And what they're trusting you for is being delivered to them in a short while. We call for the angels of God tonight. Angels, in the name of Jesus, begin to deliver that which we have believed you for. Begin to deliver that which we have trusted God for. Begin to deliver that house. Begin to deliver that financial resource. Begin to deliver that breakthrough. Begin to deliver that answer to prayer. We already have the receipt and it has been paid for and it has been guaranteed by the operating manual. The policies are clear that ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. For whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door shall be opened to him. My God, we have followed the procedures in the policy manual and we know that we have authorizing faith to believe that that which we have asked for we have received tonight starting now if you believe that you better say I receive it I take it it is my portion and there's nothing the devil can do about it now give God a, one more big hand thank you Amen. Amen. For those who have not gotten this card, please still get this card. At the back it says, and so it shall come to pass in the name of Jesus Christ starting now. Mountains are moving now. The impossible is becoming possible. God's kingdom is being established on earth as it is in heaven now. God's yes has become my amen. God's yes has become your amen. God's yes has become your amen. Amen. Believe it. Receive it. It is done. Starting now. Amen. Are you glad you came? Give two, three people a high five, even as I prepare to bless you tonight.
Amen. I pray they are smiling. If they are not, give them another high five for them to smile. <laughs> Tell your neighbor there's a cup of tea. It will rejuvenate your life. Anybody who came to church for the first time today here, they were brought here today. This is their first time. Anybody just wave at me. Where? Oh, God bless you. Come, let me give you this card. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Please come again. Okay. Anybody else? Now there might be ten. Anybody else? Upstairs. Okay, please come here so that I can give you those cards. Give me the cards. so that I can give you this card. Come here, right here. You're coming to church for the first time. Now, nakuja kwa pulpit. Don't be afraid. Come to me. Hallelujah. God bless you. This one. <laughs> okay, you'll get a card. <laughs> And I don't know. Alisa. Amen. Blessed in Jesus' name. You're also here for the first time? God bless you. Huh? God bless you. One more time as I receive those cards. Hallelujah. of our last, is it the last Wednesday? Is next week the last Wednesday? Today, today is the, today is when? Next week? Is the last Wednesday? So, birthday cake. For those in June. Do we have June babies? Or have we have celebrated your birthday already? We haven't. Did we cut that cake? We haven't. So we're going to celebrate the June people. Thanks for coming. God bless you so much. Aya, Oku. God bless you. Coffee to a pig, my coffee. I believe we may also have the testimony time, and I know you have testimonies. You come. Glad you came tonight. May I bless you as you leave. Stretch your hands to me as we pray. Father, it's been a pleasurable night, and now I release your people in your name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you peace. You're blessed in the countryside. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed tonight as you came in. You're blessed as you go out. Victory is your portion. Your 24-hour miracle is coming your way. May the Lord turn your situation around. You are courageous. You are inside the strong tower. You are a champion in Jesus' name. You are blessed to become a blessing. In the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, and God's people say, Amen. 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 
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Shalom.